Hello and welcome yet again to my top 100 games of the decade. Today we're starting with 60 to 51. If you've missed the first four parts, go back and watch those, although you should be seeing a recap of the last 10 rolling while I'm talking right now. As always, this is my personal selection of the best games of the decade. There's a lot of stuff I haven't played. There's a lot of stuff that I played and didn't maybe like as much, but this is what came out as my top 100 based on what I've played at this point in time. And yeah, I hope you're enjoying it so far, and I hope that you are interested in my selections for today, which we're going to kick off with number 60. Get ready for the next battle. I'm not much of a fighting game player. But when I do play fighting games, it's usually Tekken. Tekken has always been my favourite of the traditional fighters. I've never really got into Street Fighter and that sort of thing. And Mortal Kombat I didn't like at all. Like at least Street Fighter I could see the appeal, but Mortal Kombat, nah. Tekken, however, I'm totally into. And Tekken Tag Tournament 2 is just such a brilliant celebration of the series as a whole. Because it's got pretty much every character from Tekken's 1 to 6 in it, I believe. I could be wrong, there could be characters missing, and there are people typing going, Ah, oh, you missed out, it misses this one, you don't know about that. I know it doesn't have Gone from Tekken 3, and I know that's tied up in licensing issues, but anyway, the point is that uh, Tekken Tag Tournament 2 is kind of the big celebration of the traditional fighting series that I'm most interested in. I really like Tekken Tag 2. It's just got such a variety of characters and it looks amazing and the mechanics are just really really solid. They feel like a refinement of the entire series and what makes the series what it is. Uh, everything just feels really fluid once you know what you're doing which of course is always my criticism of fighting games but once you know what you're doing even when you don't they still feel very satisfying to play and that's kind of really all I can say about Tekken Tag Tournament 2. It's just a really fun fighting game that appeals to someone like me who isn't super into traditional fighting games. So it's clearly doing something right. So just like the really tense and atmospheric alien movie became an equally superb action movie, Dead Space 2 is the aliens to alien in video game form. So whereas the first Dead Space focused very much on atmosphere, the second game focuses more on action, and yet it still works within that context, and it's just a really good follow-up to an already great horror game. What Dead Space 2 does right is it just takes what made the first game good, and it just does more of that, but it also ramps up the action a little bit, makes it a bit more set-piece heavy, I think, but at the same time it makes it work. It plays off what made the first one good and just throws some action in with that. It does some really good stuff with horror still. You know, you keep getting hallucinations as a result of your exposure to the marker from the first game. I really liked how they characterised Isaac. They made him more of a character this time and him sort of reflecting on his relationship with Nicole was really interesting. Exploring the idea of the marker and what that is. They didn't like over explain it and kind of kept that sense of mystery to it and it was just a really good follow-up to an already great game. And it's just sad it would then go on to Dead Space 3 with its pointless relationship drama and its microtransactions and just not having that sort of tense atmosphere anymore. At least we have Dead Space 2, which was excellent in every way. <laughs> Pandora's Tower is a really odd game. At its core, it's a dungeon crawler. It's a game about these towers. It's actually more than one tower, there's 13 towers. But you go through these towers and you're trying to get to the top and defeat the, the monster that's at the top, the master, as they call them. Uh, but it's the kind of, it's the core concept behind why you're going into these towers that makes this such an interesting game. 
So the, the conceit of this is that you play as a guy called Aaron, who his girlfriend has mysteriously become the subject of a curse that will turn her gradually into a monster over time. And we see this gruesome transformation that happens to her. And what you have to do is go into these towers and collect the flesh of monsters to bring it back to her. And eating the flesh of these monsters will reverse the curse temporarily until he goes to the top of all these towers, defeats all these monsters, and she eats the flesh of all the master monsters. By doing that, that will end the curse. And it's just such a, a weird, interesting idea that also plays on the idea of your relationship with her as the game goes on, changes the game as a whole. And I just thought there was a lot of really, really interesting stuff with that. And the transformation stuff was really gruesome. As well as the just the flesh eating as well was kind of... Ugh, okay. But it did, it did all this really well and took what would have been a fairly standard dungeon crawler and just made it really fascinating. And kind of put an emotional side to it that sometimes I don't get out of dungeon crawlers. And I think it did a really good job of that. Shovel Knight is a really, really brilliant throwback platformer. What it does is it takes the really good stuff from the past. There's a lot of DuckTales in this, there's a lot of Mega Man in this, there's a lot of... a little bit of Castlevania, to a degree. But it takes all those elements and it takes the best bits, the bits that made those games so great. But what it does right is it does away with a lot of the nonsense that made that sort of era of gaming really frustrating. So when you have enemies that kind of swarm you or you have just stuff that is thrown at you without much warning, there's not a lot of that in Shovel Knight. It's challenging and it's difficult, but it feels a lot fairer than the games that it's inspired by. And that's what I really like about Shovel Knight. It takes that fun that those games had and it just refines it to a point where it works for modern audiences while still being challenging, while still being a good experience. And on top of that, it's just got a really good soundtrack too, and just and the visuals are really good as well. Like it it takes that 8-bit aesthetic and creates these really cool characters. There's some really good designs here. Just Shovel Knight himself is obviously so recognizable now that he's in every other game. It's just a fun experience with some really good designs and really good soundtrack and there's just so much love in this game not just for the 8-bit platformers but for trying to create its own identity and trying to make this brilliant platformer in its own right and I feel they did a brilliant job with it. Little Nightmares is kind of the twisted little big planet. The developers who made this game, they had worked on Little Big Planet stuff over the years, and you can kind of still see some of that DNA when you just look at the game, but to play it is a very different experience. It does not feel like Little Big Planet in any way. It just kind of looks like it. But even the further you go into it, the less that those appearances really stand out and it kind of just becomes almost like this twisted stop-motion animation and that's kind of where the appeal in this comes from it l looks and feels like you're playing this creepy messed up stop-motion cartoon and it's just brilliant for that this game's visual identity is just so gruesome but so fascinating at the same time and with its gameplay, it kind of rolls with that. It kind of rolls into the, the idea that you're isolated in this place where everyone's trying to kill you and, you know, everything you encounter seems to be monstrous in some way. And so you have all these chase mechanics and these puzzle mechanics that are kind of cinematic platformer-esque, but they're on more of a 3D plane than it first seems. 
the story is also just really good. There's a lot of ambiguity to it, but there's a lot of telling its story without dialogue, and it goes to some interesting places. The places that it went to are not places I expected it to go, and it got creepier the more that I played it. And there's just so many memorable moments, like the ending is really memorable, not to spoil it. And you've got this whole sequence where there's like a whole group of guests who've arrived and they're just furiously eating food and you're trying to avoid being eaten by them and it's just so good it's so well put together just every aspect of Little Nightmares is just this creepy stop motion animation esque experience that I really really enjoyed I'm not super into first-person shooters as a general rule, but where Doom appeals to me is it knows what it's about and it runs with it. It doesn't try and be a serious message about war. It does away with the idea of military conflict or all these other things that tend to just make me roll my eyes every time I see an FPS. What Doom does is it goes Back in the day, this was just a really silly thing about running around shooting demons. That's what we're bringing back, and that's what we are just leaning into 100%. This game is brutal and completely unashamed about that. It knows what it's about. It is a game where you are a man who hunts demons, and you're going to go hunt some demons. And they make a lot of concessions to modern gaming. You've got the characters speaking to you over a radio. But it's how this character responds to that, despite we never see his face, we never hear his voice, and yet he's got such a good character with that. Like moments where he'll just disobey what characters are telling him to do. He will just rip things apart when he's told to, like, treat things with care. He wants to just take down the demons and he doesn't care about anything else and honestly he's done with with everything that you've done to cause this to happen in the first place he's not making any concessions to you and honestly I love it I love that it does that and the gameplay is just fun and you've got all these weapons that you can just switch in and out at will and just so many ways of defeating things. This is not a cover shooter, you're just going all over the place. Uh, fast paced, in your face, non-stop action, and it's so much fun to play. It does slightly outstay its welcome towards the end, I think, but for the most part it's a fun, brutal roller coaster ride of a game, and I enjoyed it immensely. It's the game of the movie of the game. It is Ratchet and Clank from 2016. I've always been a fan of the Ratchet and Clank series. I've not actually seen the movie, but honestly, considering my major criticism of the game, I kind of don't feel like I want to see the movie because my criticism of the game comes from the movie that it's trying to build itself around, and that is the characterization of Ratchet and Clank themselves, which they messed up dramatically I feel they kind of just instantly become friends and they decide we're gonna go off on space adventures but if you go back and play the original Ratchet and Clank you see it doesn't actually pan out like that they don't get on and that's where a lot of the joy of the characterization and the story comes from that sort of odd couple relationship that the two have Ratchet's a laid-back surfer dude and here's this very strict robot and they kind of learn to, to work with each other and, and that kind of builds their friendship for the rest of the series and the, removing all of that entirely from the storyline is what hurts this game but outside of that the actual game itself is a celebration of Ratchet & Clank's history it is ostensibly a remake of the first Ratchet & Clank but despite that it doesn't just faithfully recreate it it kind of takes bits from across the series and brings it all together to kind of make this just beautiful roundup of everything good from the series. The weapon selection is amazing and the fact they brought the Groovatron back even though it wasn't in the first game 
is brilliant. I'm happy with that. It looks brilliant. I just think that they leaned into the aesthetic of, of the game a lot more and it just updates that that original game which looks a bit dated now because it was on the PS2 but they've really brought it forward. The environments look great. The weapon selection is great. So much love went into this game and you can tell that Insomniac even after years of making Ratchet & Clank games still love making Ratchet & Clank games and this is just like the best of the series in my opinion. Once again we come to Mario, but this one I feel I have a bit more to talk about than just it's Mario and it's nice and it's cute. No, um, this is Nintendo finally acknowledging the creativity that comes out of the ROM hack scene. I'm not just talking about the, the Kaizo stuff where people just are dicks for no reason. I'm talking about like where people really do just make their own stellar Mario levels. And Nintendo just kind of went, let's give them an official version of doing that. They could have just slapped something together for this. They could have made something super basic, but they actually did a really good job with this. I haven't played Super Mario Maker 2, so I don't know how much they improved on this on the Switch, but on the Wii U, they did a good job with this. There's a lot of really cool features in building a level. The fact that they had the different themes and the different games that you could draw from. They didn't just go, here's Super Mario Brothers, make levels in that engine. They went, here's Super Mario Brothers, and Super Mario Brothers 3, and Super Mario World, and even a new Super Mario Brothers as well. And they all work like the original games, which is great. And just being able to mix and match everything together, it's such an easy tool to use as well. Like everything feels really fluid. A lot more so than something like Little Big Planet, which I really love the system in that, but this just it's just constantly everything's within your grasp within seconds. Whereas sometimes there are things in Little Big Planet which can take a while to get to, like especially if you want to play test it. Whereas this you just press a button in the corner and oh look here, now you're playing it. It just works really well and Nintendo should be commended for just putting together this really good level editor. And it's just, it, there's neat little touches as well, like the way that the soundtrack is blended into the construction. So like when you place things on, it's like a note in the actual track. And yeah, I just, I really like what they did with, with this. And uh, I need to get on to Super Mario Maker 2 and see how they improved it. Tearaway is a really sweet little adventure from Media Molecule. You know, the people who made Little Big Planet, it's unsurprising that I ended up liking their weird little Vita project that uh, kind of carried a lot of their usual whimsy and sense of humour and just love of crafting and all that stuff. And they made this little adventure for the Vita that um, just, it was really really fun. It was full of charming little things, like you had the little squirrel guys who would hang around the whole time and you could make you could make things for them. You had the Wendigos, like the little baby Wendigo that you had to help out at one point, that was quite cute. And they just, they nailed it. Again, they made like this really sweet little craft based adventure that um, made a lot of really good use of the Vita's own features. So the Vita was a great console that Sony didn't support properly, but if they'd done more stuff like Tearaway, I think it would have done a lot better because Tearaway really just leaned into everything. It used the rear touchpad for things, it used the cameras, it used just everything possible, motion sensors, all the rest of it. It was all in there and it was all used without being obnoxious or felt like it was forced in. It all just weaved into this really nice little adventure. And yeah, it's just a shame that uh, the Vita didn't do very well, so that this didn't do better as well. So it's a shame because it was a good, nice little adventure that's definitely worth your time. On paper this game sounds absolutely awful and the reality is it's not awful and it has no right to be as good as it is. So the rabbits are obnoxious, uh, they are a terrible 
terrible set of characters that Ubisoft like to push on people as much as possible. But weirdly, this game kind of salvages them and makes them not terrible, almost minion-esque terrible things. And I'm astounded. And at first you'd think, well, it's because of the Nintendo influence, if Nintendo were involved. Nintendo weren't really involved in this project. They licensed it, obviously, but they didn't directly get involved in its development. It was all Ubisoft that made this, and it's really, really good. It's got gameplay that's surprisingly tactical. It feels very much like a good strategy RPG, which you wouldn't expect from a game mixing Mario and Rabbids. They managed to make the crossover work in a weird sort of way. You wouldn't think it would, but they made it work in a way that just felt natural. And yeah, it just it surprised me for its entire run of just how good it actually was. It was charming, it was funny, it had some great music, the gameplay was really fun, and each character as well felt distinct. And yeah, it was like, this is very, very good stuff, and I'm genuinely surprised that this game exists and is as good as it is. And that's it for another edition. We are now at the halfway point of this entire top 100. We have had the entire first 50 run through, and now we're into the really good stuff in the top 50. Oh yes. So uh, let me know what you thought of the game so far. Let me know what you're expecting to arrive in the next half of this countdown. And thank you for following along so far. I'll see you again tomorrow with the next 10 as we count down from 50 to 41. What will be in that selection? I guess you got to find out tomorrow, as usual. I'll see you then. <laughs>